right, folks, welcome to Nostalgia Trap. David Parsons here. I hope all is well with you, and I hope you have a fantastic Thanksgiving week if you celebrate. I am very excited to present this interview with good friend of the program, Rax King. She is the author of a book called Tacky. We had Rax on a few months ago uh, to talk about Guy Fieri. I love that episode, and I love her take on sort of trash American culture. Her book, Tacky, Love Letters to the Worst Culture We Have to Offer, is a really wonderful set of essays about culture, about wrestling with what your own cultural tastes mean. And I had a really fun time talking with her in this conversation. Um, Always, always challenging stuff from her. So I hope you enjoy this. I hope you have a great holiday. We've got lots of more Nostalgia Trap stuff on the way. And we had a really great time on our first movie club the other day. We talked about The Night of the Hunter. That episode is up now for subscribers. And if you're not a subscriber, I don't know what you're doing. You can do that at patreon.com slash nostalgia trap. We are a totally listener supported operation. So five bucks a month or five bucks once is really, really helpful to us, believe it or not. Patreon.com slash nostalgia trap. Really appreciate it. And enjoy this conversation and go check out Rax's podcast as well called Low Culture Boil. She's got some really fun takes on all of this stuff. Here is me and the one and only Rax King. All right, Rax King, thanks so much for joining me. How are you? I'm doing good. Thank you for having me. I um, I should tell you that I, in honor of uh, this podcast with you this morning, I had a piece of pumpkin pie for breakfast. Hell yeah. What, wait, was it good? Of course. Okay. <laughs> I don't know I if mean, you're like pro or anti pumpkin pie. There's a lot of just, takes some people, out there. Some people think pie for breakfast is just not the way to be. Um, but I find that I've always loved pie for breakfast, and I had a Costco pumpkin pie. I don't know if you've had the pleasures of the Costco pumpkin pie, but I have an aunt uh, who told me yesterday, because it was my dad's birthday, we all we all talked in the family, she told me that uh, she will only eat a pumpkin pie from Costco. Like, it's the only pumpkin pie she will enjoy. I don't know. Have you had the Costco pumpkin pie? Do you know what I'm talking about? Costco pie in general is kind of the best pie. I feel like out of all the supermarket type chains that do in-house food, Costco's is always the best. And people do not talk about that enough for my taste. Mm. Yeah, they have like, um, Costco has like this whole kitchen in the back that's like, it's got um, glass, like plexiglass, so you can like see the workings of the kitchen. It's like being in Disneyland. Yeah. <laughs> and the workers are like the, um, the animatronic robots at the Natural History <laughs> Museum. Um, I really enjoyed your book, Tacky. Uh, before we even get started, I want to just l- l- tell everyone that's why we're talking. Um, because you've got a book out called Tacky that is, for me, I spent the last couple weeks um, dipping into all of the different pieces of this book. Um, and it's hard to describe it, honestly. Uh, the, the word tacky is maybe the best way, but I mean this in the in the most uh, in in the most complimentary way possible. That it made me think that there's like a there needs to be like a German word to describe a lot of what you're trying to do in this book. I, I guess we can start with like the NPR question: Why tacky? What what what? Why did you want to write about tacky subjects and your own relationship to them? A couple reasons. Uh... I guess primarily because that just happens to comprise most of the stuff I like, which I've always been a little bit embarrassed by because I came up as a teenager with like DIY punk types who did not understand why I would be sneakily listening to Creed in my leisure time and stuff like that. And, you know, the implication was always that there was something wrong with my taste and I needed to undergo some kind of corrective taste surgery Mm -hmm. in order to purge myself of this urge to engage with just the the silliest pieces of pop culture, which, I mean, that urge never did go away. But I'm also interested, Mm -hmm. even outside the bounds of my own personal experience, I'm interested in what I see as tackiness versus campiness. To me, if you're calling something tacky, you're usually saying it's campy, but without the irony. Like there is no way really to ironically enjoy, again, the music of Creed or the food at the Cheesecake Factory. Like it's it's too straightforward or maybe 
takes itself a little too seriously to be open to that ironic interpretation. And so you're left with the urge to be embarrassed by yourself. And like, I can't appreciate this thing ironically. So I have to do it in secret and be a little uncomfortable with myself and a little uncomfortable around my friends because they're not on board the way I am. Mm -hmm. And that itself was very interesting to me that there can be these pieces of pop culture that bring us joy on one level, but also that we feel we have to enjoy in secret on another. Yeah, I, I wondered the whole time I'm reading your book, I'm thinking about like, where does I, I'm, I'm glad you mentioned the DIY punk culture. I, I wish I, I, I could hear a little bit more about that from you in terms of like, where does the anxiety comes from come from? Because not everyone has this anxiety, right? Like a lot of right. people in America, go to Cheesecake Factory and, and don't think that they're, you know, doing anything that they should be ashamed of at all or anything right. that they should have anxiety about. And yet, I don't know, when you have a certain like p- kind of set of political or cultural perspectives, it makes you feel like the entirety of American consumer culture is wrong uh, and you should feel guilty about engaging with it at all, which I've, found, I've struggled with in my life for sure. And I really recognize a lot of the sort of conflict that you're writing about in this book. Yeah, I think uh, what you're getting at there, and I've I've been thinking about this a lot while doing press for this book, because it does tend to come up that the things I'm writing about are very popular and really mm-hmm. don't need defending from the standpoint of you should like this because I see a lot of reasons to like it. And I, right. I don't feel that way. Like, there are plenty of very good reasons not to like anything that I've written about in this book, Jersey Shore, <laughs> Creed, The Cheesecake Factory, like there's any number of reasons to... And you acknowledge just, them in your yeah. book. I think they, they, I, part of the pleasure of reading your book is, is, is reading your own sort of wrestling with what this stuff means. Yeah, I, I really hope that the vibe isn't just pure and simple, let people enjoy things. Because I don't think that's... No. I mean, that's just not the point I'm trying to make. The point I'm trying to make is that there's this moment of undue contrast, I think, in anything that we look at as tacky. Like there's this moment where we see a person and we think they don't have enough money to be dressed that way, to be wearing such like loud, flashy clothes. Mm -hmm. We see Donald Trump with his well-done steak and the ketchup on the side. And we're like, if we had that much money, we would be eating such better food than this asshole. There's always a moment of contrast. You see somebody doing something that violates what you believe they should be doing. And Mm -hmm. your urge is to point the finger, call the behavior tacky, say that there's no reason to have a plastic slip cover on that sofa. You know, it it always comes as a judgment. It's never, you never hear somebody say something is tacky in a neutral way. It's always tacky and therefore bad. Yeah, no, I agree. And, and a lot of that, um, I don't know. We talk a lot about like the, like Gen X, like '90s culture, which was a lot, a lot of like anti-consumerism, and I'm a, a little bit older than you, and I grew up around that as a young person, and and exactly that DIY punk attitude. But at the same time, I was raised in the suburbs, and like that was all the stuff that I got pleasure from. Like I had to, to like learn to be a snob, and ironically, learn to be that way from the people who are like trying to save the planet and like that kind of thing. And that, that, right. that conflict is really hard to reconcile as I get older. Cause I do get like, I don't know. I do get pleasure from, uh, from a lot of the things you're describing, like chain restaurants, et cetera. At the same time, I feel exactly the, the sort of intellectual, I guess that's like kind of a pull between like the intellectualizing of this stuff and actually feeling it. And that's what it feels like a lot of what your book is trying to wrestle with is, is pleasure, right? Like it seems like this part of what you're doing is interrogating what it means to feel good. Yeah, I think that's apt. And I mean, it's perfect timing. Just yesterday, I believe, uh, B.D. McClay published a story on Gawker uh, to the effect of pleasure isn't politics. And I, I think that there has been a pull towards politicizing anything that gives you pleasure, right? Like you you want it to be acceptable, not just because it's beautiful and makes you happy, but because it is also in line with your political mm-hmm. principles. Mm-hmm. And I think that's also a big part of the attitude that you're talking about is like, yeah, these punks are the people trying to save the planet and like believing in the same ideals that I do, politically speaking. And yet there's this 
tension where like we can't get on board with the same stuff culturally all the time. I think that tends to be a really major point of tension for a lot of people is mm. like, it's the same way that if you grew up real religious and then you fall away from it later in your life, there's a chance you still wouldn't like hearing outsiders shit on your religion of your childhood because you were in it. You got right. something out of it. Even right. if it wound up ruining your life in some way, it's hard to say that it ruined your life completely. And I feel that way about a lot of the stuff that brought me joy and pleasure as a child is like, no, it's really not in line with my political principles. And that's a tension that I have to grapple with. But it's not anybody else's tension to grapple with. It's not down to anyone else to point at me and say, hey, you're a communist and you like the Cheesecake Factory and Outback Steakhouse. Like, how do you reconcile that? Because the answer really is, yeah, how do I? But also, is this really what we're worrying about right now? Yeah. Like, Cheesecake yeah. Factory is some good ass food. <laughs> and how do any of us reconcile any of that? I mean, that's the thing is like uh, uh, thinking about the the DIY punks living um, on your block that you describe as your your neighbors that are out smoking cigarettes um, on the. I'm just wondering, like, you know, what what is their position and with relationship to all this stuff? Because like, it seems like. It, I used to be able to convince myself that you could live outside of American consumer culture, right. but it seems like it's increasingly impossible. And so if we're going to like live our lives kind of judging what's good and what's bad about that stuff, it seems like the wrong way to be, if that makes sense. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm not convinced that it was ever the right way to be. I mean, you hear about these people like 50, 60 years ago, they get it in their heads like, fuck consumerism, we're going to go start a commune in the country. And the vast majority of those projects failed mm -hmm. really quickly. And I think that even if you're not trying to evade consumer culture on the same scale or with the same dedication, you're always going to frustrate yourself with the urge to do so. Like, yes, it is absolutely possible to make different choices, but they're still consumer choices. Like any choice you make yeah. on the level of consuming X versus Y and, you know, buying this version of the thing that's biodegradable rather than this version that's not, those choices are shallow. And I, I make some of those choices myself, of sure. course. I think everybody does some of that bargaining with themselves. And mm -hmm. at this point, I'm just having to be honest that I do it because it makes me feel good. And I like to do things that I can feel a little better about being in line with my principles as opposed to things that I'm just flagrantly saying, fuck you, fuck the planet. I'm going to get mine before I die. Yeah, there's a relate. Those are two different types of pleasure, though, right? The sort of like the pleasure of I'm doing the right thing uh, and I'm buying the meat from Whole Foods that has the special number on it that tells me <laughs> that the cage was really soft and comfy for the animal before they slaughtered it, like that sort yeah. of thing. But there's also just the pleasure of I don't know. And I, the, the hedonism or the just the pure erotics of uh, eating a Big Mac and that sort of thing. I mean, it makes me think of like, I mean, just because Pearl Jam are all good guys that are environmentalists doesn't make their music any better. You know what I mean? <laughs> like, Yeah, that's the other thing is a lot of the stuff that is 100 percent in line with my idealized political principles a lot of it is just plain not fun in any way <laughs> right and it's like what do you want me to do i can't make myself organically get pleasure from something that is not pleasurable i can mm. make myself engage with it anyway and i think a lot of us feel the need to do that i know i mm -hmm. occasionally do mm -hmm. but I, at the end of the day, you can't force an honest reaction to something. And so that that moment of reaction is really interesting to me. That moment where you're hearing a song or watching a movie for the first time and it either clicks or it doesn't. Yeah, yeah, no, totally. Um, and, and that's part of what I feel like. I mean, I, I don't know if you're comfortable with these words, but I mean, you've written a memoir and you've written something that's like coming of age, right? Like a lot of what I feel like I was reading was is about um, in your book is about sort of this tabula rasa kid, like like just seeking pure the exactly what you're talking about, the like the pure pleasure, um, but then also crashing into um, being a smart kid, right? Someone who's like analytical, um, someone who uh, the one of the, one of my favorite for, uh, sentences in your book is about. 
and I'm, I'll, I'll just paraphrase it, but it, it says that, you know, you're comfortable talking about things like Heidegger and Hegel, but why would we want to do that? I, I, that, to me, that found like, I, I, I found that very recognizable. The idea that like, um, you like the pleasure and you don't want to ruin it with the analysis of it, if that makes sense. Um, but at the yeah. same time, what you've done here, I think is like, give us an analysis of pleasure. That yeah, I, I mean, it's tricky. And I always felt like I was bumping up against these like irreconcilable contrasts with on the one hand, being, how do I say this without sounding totally self aggrandizing? <laughs> I, I mean, I am fairly well read, I think. And I've done a lot of this like theoretical heavy lifting both in school and on my own time mm -hmm. and i i don't feel really like i'm a poser on that front like i can know what the fuck y'all are talking about on twitter all day long i want to know why like, you wanted that so why did you what drew you to that sort of stuff honestly i mean a lot of things part partly i just fucking like to read and yeah. i want to know more things like that's certainly one aspect of it but a much more emotionally significant aspect of it was that I am insecure. And, you know, I feel like I'm always intellectually trying to prove something mm -hmm. to people that I look at as smarter and better than me. And one thing that those people tend to do in, in my life is point the finger at the stuff I like and say it's tacky and bad. And so I end up in this I guess, locked into this debate with myself where I'm like, yes, I want to read more. I want to understand what the fuck these people are talking about. And I want to contribute something to these conversations. I also really want to eat a big old cheeseburger once in a while. Yeah. I want to like go stay in a trashy motel and go to the boardwalk and mm -hmm. wear a toe ring, all, all that kind of stuff <laughs> that is really low stakes, actually. Like it's mm -hmm. very low stakes for a single person to do any of this shit. Mm -hmm. So why should it matter to these people I'm trying to impress? Yeah. Yeah. No, I mean, I feel that as someone who's, you know, went and went to graduate school, but didn't really come from a family full of graduate school people and ended up like meeting people that I, had all these attitudes about this stuff like um I, I mentioned that i'd like to go to las vegas and gamble like at a you know, during a grad seminar once and the looks i got from everyone like it was exactly the, exactly what you're talking about which is like um that's something that like low people do and and yeah. that, that makes me think about the whole project like is education really about like training people to be snobs like we're so, like we're describing because it seems like a lot of it is particularly infuriating about that because that those are my circumstances too like i come from a family of i'm just gonna affectionately call them trashy ass people mm -hmm. love them but you know i didn't i wasn't raised in one of those families where the stuff of grad school was constantly on the table right. it has never been expected that i would go to grad school and i i haven't been mm -hmm. but i think it's especially infuriating to get this treatment from just for lack of a better word, grad school types, because so many of them want to improve things, they say, for the working class as they yeah, understand it. Right. And it's just like, what the fuck do you think these people that you're talking about are doing? Like they're they're going to the track and, and gambling and mm -hmm. doing all kinds of shit. And yeah, sometimes they're also going to college and going to grad school and y'all don't seem to like that either. Like mm -hmm. it's this ever shifting bundle of expectations that gets named the working class and discussed at length constantly. And anytime I've engaged with people like that, like in a real way, it's been disappointing because it's just like, I feel that you're so much smarter and better educated than me. Mm. And yet the entire first like 25 years of my life were characterized by work and study about which you know nothing. Yeah. And the game of politics seems like um, it's something that 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 group ought to pay more attention to, because I'm thinking about like, uh, I mean, when you see like Trump's picture with like all the McDonald's um, like that, to, like one of the most iconic photos of our era. And it seems like when I saw that, I, I knew that liberals would take the bait on it and be like, oh, look at the trash. Look at the Kid Rock shit that he brings to the White House. This And look how he has sullied this institution of democracy, etc. But it's, when, I, when I look at Trump in the McDonald's picture, I'm thinking this guy's smarter than them. 
in the way he's using exactly the sort of erotics that you're talking about, right? Like this stuff matters right. to people. Right. Yeah. The There are all these cultural touchstones that mm -hmm. people want to insist are like stupid and lame and for dumbasses. But at the same time, they're the ones bestowing this magnificent importance on stuff like serving a bunch of McDonald's to a bunch of Olympians. Like that act is kind of neutral unto itself. I mean, folks got to eat something, but there's like, again, it's that contrast of the cheap thing in the White House being served to incredible athletes. Like it's a yeah. three-way contrast that people uh -huh. can't resist. They just have to point at it and be like, fuck that. God, I remember, I forgot, I forgot that it was Olympian. It was athletes that they were yeah. serving that too. Yeah, yeah. That's incredible. Um, uh, can we talk about the mall? Because you, yeah. you you do a you do quite a bit about the mall and made me very um, nostalgic about the mall um, and the the early days of Hot Topic. Hot Topic isn't anything like it used to be. Have you been to Hot Topic recently? I've I've seen how they've massacred my boy in, in <laughs> recent years. I mean, it just why is it so bright in there now? What happened to the outside that looks like a dungeon? Yeah, it's it's not the same place. Um, oh. And I feel really weird being the age I am walking in there. Yeah, I, um, it never felt right. Like even as a teenager walking in there, something didn't feel right about it. But as a grown up walking into new hot topic, I'm like, this just makes me look like a pedophile. <laughs> yeah, it's basically it's a lot of like uh, anime and Stranger Things, basically like yeah. a, a huge Stranger Things wall. Um, yeah, it be, I mean, it became like a pop culture shop. And, yeah. and I'm thinking, like, was it always a pop culture shop? It seems like it was like a raver goth shop when I was younger. But, you know, even though it was a raver goth shop, it still was a pop culture shop. It was just different pop culture at the time. I would go yeah. in there and, you know, they, they had this wall of band T-shirts, big oh, yeah. old wall of band T-shirts. And mm -hmm. I would stand there like little 12-year-old racks and look at all the bands I'd never heard of and feel awe. And now... I think about some of the bands that I was seeing on the t-shirts and I'm like, Th those guys sucked. <laughs> like, why, why was I so, I guess, intellectually and even erotically excited by the sight of all this stuff that I didn't know what it was yet? What was it about the setting plus the act of not knowing what this stuff was? It just filled me with a desire to be like the stuff I was seeing. Yeah, that um well it's funny you mentioned that with the wall of rock and roll t-shirts. It seems like a, a ubiquitous sort of presence in like record stores. I don't know if anyone remembers record stores, but like I mean there's one in, in my town actually that's still like a big hippie record store with the giant wall of t-shirts. It's funny yeah. that it's all the, always the same bands. Like I feel like it's been the same bands for like 30 years. Like Led Zeppelin, Pink Floyd, Black Flag is always up there. Like the t-shirt um, industry on that has now shifted to Target, though. Like, if you go to Target, they have that wall now, too. Yeah, and, and Urban Outfitters has the same setup, but all That's of theirs right. are, like, pre-distressed, which even as a teenager, I knew was super lame. Your clothes could not come pre-distressed. You had to distress them. Yourself. Yeah. Yeah. Just by living in them. Like, that was <laughs> that was what was cool. And as far as I know, that's still the case. But, I mean, it's such a shifting mutable thing like of course hot topic doesn't look anything now like it did when i was a kid that was an amount of time ago that i'd rather not say <laughs> well well even more for me i mean I don't, I don't know what the history of hot Topic. i don't know when that hot topic like started as a business but i i definitely remember seeing it and thinking that uh i was already old enough to be like oh this is the corporatization of right. uh you know a subversive culture as if like led zeppelin had not already been like a major <laughs> corporate bullshit already um yeah, uh, the, I want to talk about the mall because of exactly what we're talking about, which is like the mall is supposed to be like a like a mistake historically. Like, you know, like it's a shitty place that in, you know, in the, the world of the 20th century historian, you know, the mall is the ultimate symbol of like what went wrong by like suburbanizing the country, etc. And then, you know, it becomes this kind of crass symbol of all the tacky pop culture you're talking about. Yet at the same time, I was raised like, in an environment where going to the mall was like the greatest thing in the world. Like I really, really looked forward to going to the mall and had to, again, learn that all the pleasure I was taking when I was a kid was actually really bad. And that's a difficult thing to square as you get older. It's difficult because, I mean, you know, I, I also 
absorbed a lot of the the anti mall messaging back when I was, I think, more vulnerable to that sort of thing. And I just assumed it had to be correct. It was inarguable because, you know, calling something consumerist, that's usually the point at which argument ends. If you're an impressionable teenager, you're Mm -hmm. just like, oh, it's consumerist. It's bad. But I mean, looking more into the history of the American mall, like it, it's really not so bad. And, I, you know, I don't want to relitigate the enjoyment that I always took from being at the mall on those terms. But at the same time, it is worth noting that the architect who is credited with inventing the American mall was a socialist. Like he was trying <laughs> to draw these these exurbs into themselves so that people would be forced into each other's company. If they wanted something to do to, for the day, they would have to go into this central space where it wasn't just stuff for sale. There were like places to walk around, food that you could eat, places to sit, and just all kinds of stuff that we don't really credit the shopping mall with. But at the same time, if you're living in one of those suburbs and there's so little walking space, you got to get in your car and drive anytime you want to do something. Under those circumstances, the mall is kind of a godsend. It's a whole giant building where you don't need to have your car inside of it. You can just walk around and be a person and, yeah, buy things. Yeah, and they have uh, playgrounds in there for kids, even. Yeah, there's, like, stuff for kids to do. There's those fucking Brookstone stores that I'd never understood the point of. You know, you go in, you sit in the massage chair for a while. That's an afternoon right there. (laughs) And you can, just like any city, uh, you know, because it is like a little city. I always thought of like, to me, going to the mall was like the same feeling I got when I eventually went to New York City. It was like, wow, like this feeling of there's so many different avenues and things to get involved in and and people. Yeah, exactly the sort of socialist utopia you're describing. Um, But also like like identity formation happens there. And you write really eloquently about that because you reminded me of a store that I never went in, but I remember seeing it limited to (laughs) T-O-O. And you tell a story about uh, about wanting like a varsity jacket. And it, it really it was one of those things that really resonated with me. The idea that you 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 not being a popular kid and wanting to like you know, fantasizing about going to a different school and starting over. I totally had that idea. And 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 the thought that you would wear a jacket on the first day and like somehow establish yourself as the cool person at that new school. Um, but then you saw Hot Topic. What I mean, what was it like if you it, I know this is in the book, but what was it like to see Hot Topic for the first time? Because it's an important sort of moment. Yeah, I mean, I think it is. I think a lot of kids have a similar type of moment, like a lot of uncool type kids. Uh, So for context sake, I was like, I don't know, eight or nine ish and super unpopular, like super struggling at school. And all the popular girls, their uniform was closed from limited Two, which was like a store for little girls and tweens. But Mm -hmm. pretty much what they sold was just miniature versions of like, high school girls cool clothes it was it was very obvious like what the appeal was for little elementary school bitchy girls as opposed to high school bitchy girls it was Mm -hmm. the same clothes and it was also crazy expensive my mom was not trying to drop that much money on like a jacket that I I probably wouldn't even like like Mm -hmm. I just was fixated on this jacket that they sold as the thing I could buy and once I had it everything would fall into place for me. And then uh, they opened a Hot Topic in my mall and my mom and I were like walking around and I saw it and realized that this was the type of clothes that I could buy and everything would be fixed for me. It was the exact opposite type as the ones I'd been fixated on before, which meant that they had to be the answer this time. Right. And there were so many people in the Hot Topic who looked kind of punkish and scary to me in a way that was really appealing because I was like, well, I I probably won't ever beat the popular girls on their own turf playing by their rules, but here's this whole other set of rules that I could choose to play by instead and, you know, defeat them that way. And of course, I was blind at that time to the fact that it's all the same shit. Like, it's just, you know, limited to, but black and hot pink. Yeah, Yeah. it's just costumes. And I just... I wasn't picking up on that. I thought that one of these costumes 
had to be the answer. And once I found the right one, I'd put it on and it'd be like a superhero <laughs> uniform. You know, yep. I'd turn into Superman. Yeah. I, I had a, a student a couple semesters ago who showed up. Um, he was just wearing like old Navy clothes to school all the time. I noticed him, though, wanting wanting to be noticed in class. And he showed up in a motorcycle jacket. Um, and he's like, you know, he's like 18 years old. And it was like a, it was like watching a like high school sitcom because he like, stru- you know, strutted into class with his motorcycle jacket. And it made me think exactly what you're talking about. Like this sort of I, I remember I remember wearing cowboy boots to high school and thinking this is going to turn things around for me. Somehow. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's always the clothes. It's always like you're going to find the right uniform to wear like you're a cartoon character. And once you find the one that is actually you, people will respect you accordingly and of course it just doesn't work that way but it's never ending though better. right like yeah. i'm still i'm still like getting tattoos in part to be like this next one will complete my <laughs> coolness you know what i mean like it yeah. seems like it's never ending <laughs> yeah i mean there's still that like insecure child inside me like i'm like a like a gundam or something and mm-hmm. there's a child in my body operating the controls and I think with her brain half the time, I still, you know, as you say, I still dress for other people in a big way. And I also am still getting tattoos and haircuts and whatnot, doing my makeup in a particular way. I wear contacts instead of glasses, partly for that reason. It all feeds into the little girl insecurities that, you know, at, at this point, I should be too big. They shouldn't fit anymore. But it's like when you're born and you're a kid, you develop insecurities and they follow you for the rest of your life. Yeah. And and fuel this incredible vanity that somehow is supposed to be, um, I don't know, tacky, right? Like even yeah. even vanity itself is supposed to be so, a value that, especially if you're a punk, we keep saying punk DIY in, in, in place of like the left or whatever, because <laughs> I, I don't know what we're saying, really. Counterculture, I mean... There's a lot of different but ways like of putting it. But we both know what we're talking about. It's very yeah. much you know it when you see it sort of thing. But yeah, I mean, sort of moralizing about uh, moralizing about being an American, uh, an American consumer. And it's all, honestly like capitalism is so global that it's not even just being an American anymore. It's just like this sort of, I don't know, engaging with a certain type of pleasure, even like the pleasure of being vain and like doing your hair. It's like, what are you supposed to do? Like, should I like... Like, I don't know. There's this idea that I should like put on the communist jumpsuit <laughs> and like have no style whatsoever. I don't I don't know if that's like the future I want. I mean, I yell at myself about that all the time, though. I'm always just like, you know, are you really going to get up this morning and remake yourself as a commodity and like present yourself <laughs> yeah. to the world like that? And then, you know. I got to remind myself all the time. It's not that fucking deep. And I don't have that much control where making myself as a commodity is having any appreciable effect on the rest of the world. Like Mm -hmm. I can either do what makes me feel good to an extent. I mean, there are limits, but I could do that or I could torture myself and hold myself to a fairly impossible standard, I think. Yeah, no, totally. Um, I think that feeling guilty all the time or feeling shitty about everything you're doing is uh is is not the way to be and yet it's it's always there like i recently um my wife was out of town and so like what does a 43 year old man do in the suburbs when he's alone you know i was like well i'll go to the mall and have orange chicken at panda express which is what i did and i remember i was sitting there and thinking like looking at everyone else like eating their orange chicken cuz that's all anyone gets at panda express i think yeah. <laughs> and you know i'm having these layers of like uh, 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 i'm here at the mall you know eating this and this is something different than i usually do and look at how these other people are not um may, i'm 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 assuming they're not doing the same like analysis of what's happening but like why why should i assume that like you know i I feel like everyone understands where they're at um yeah i mean my assumption (laughs) is that you know i i figured that the vast majority of just strangers i see in the food court are not having their own little communist crises about you know should i really be eating sabaro or should i be at the punk house like making flyers for something and Mm. You know, I I figure most people aren't having that internal argument, but I also think that most people that I see in the food court are having some kind of internal argument about, 
<laughs> what am I doing in this food court? What am I doing at the mall? What am I doing at the mall in 2021? You know, the mall's supposed to be this dead thing. Why am right. I at one having a pretty good time? You know, I, mm-hmm. I think that argument happens in more heads than we tend to give credit for, because I do think that at this juncture, people mostly see the mall as a bad thing. Yeah. Oh, totally. And I mean, and, and a dead space too. Yeah. Like a dead space that's still there somehow. Um, yeah. They're it's... clinging to life with their movie theaters. They're retooling food courts. They mm-hmm. took out the Sabaro from my hometown mall, which was really intensely fucked up of them to do, but whatever. But it's always, you know, they're, they're trying all these things to revive what they see as a corpse. And I just feel like they're getting farther away from what made them all fun in the first place. I <laughs> yeah. don't know. Yeah. Um, that that's that like tendency to, to be critical um, is is such a weird curse because it's at the, on, the, on the one hand, I'm glad I'm able to sort of understand how the Cheesecake Factory is connected to climate change. Uh, but at the other, uh, the other end of it, it kind of ruins it. And I feel like part of what you're doing in your book is trying to recover pleasure from, from the things that have in part been ruined by, by a culture that sort of looks at this stuff as all damaging. Yeah. I mean, I think a big part of that perspective that says all this stuff is inherently damaging that's partly American Puritanism at work, right? Yeah, like we totally. would look for any way to deny ourselves pleasure. And that's just, you know, a slightly different route to denying yourself pleasure in a sense. But I also think that, you know, I am grateful for having this understanding of the world that makes something like the Cheesecake Factory a little harder to swallow. Like I'd rather know the stuff than not. But I talk in my book about uh, Susan Sontag's essay, Against Interpretation. I think that's what it's called. Hmm. Mm-hmm. And um, But she says in it that interpretation is a really good way to strip all the joy out of something. You know, Good or bad interpretation, favorable or not, it doesn't matter. The interpreting act itself is enough to... It's It's like trying to capture lightning in a bottle. Like the harder you work to say what is good about something that you think is good, the more dull you make it and right. the more you take the shine off the apple. And I think that a big part of my project is because I can't go back and unknow stuff and be a little girl experiencing something for the first time mm-hmm. again, but I can describe how it felt that first time. And I can try to convince myself that being uncomplicatedly joyful about something the first time you witness it is significant. Even if the harm done by it is also in some way significant, the joy itself is significant and worth Mm. deconstructing, I think. No, I I agree. Um, And that's why it's a coming of age story to me (laughs) to use that word. We haven't, we haven't used the word brave yet. Um, (laughs) I assume you're getting there. (laughs) But I mean, uh, you you talk about sex that way in this book. Um, It's sort of like the, Talk, talking about it too much is going to ruin it. It's kind of a, a classic idea about that. But what you've done, I think, is recreated like these kind of moments along the along the way of your learning that always that always are surprising lessons in part because they're coming from that that pure place. Like you're seeking you're seeking the pleasure first and then uh, sort of figuring out what it means. It seems like it's I don't know how conscious a project that was for you. Um, but it seems like it seems like something that is um, a big part of who you are is is sort of uh, seeking the pleasure first and then and then kind of packing it into your your mental landscape, if that makes sense. Yeah, no, that's absolutely how I've been bumbling along since <laughs> <laughs> since I was born, pretty mm-hmm. much. But uh, I mean, yeah, sex is in that way a big part of my development. And I've already uh gotten some negative Goodreads reviews to the effect of there is way too much sex in this book. She needs to tone it down. And I think that people who say that are, they were maybe expecting some more straightforward, like cultural criticism or even memoir. But to me, sex is something that absolutely is tacky. The way that like people respond to other people having Mm -hmm. sex makes it clear that good or bad sex is extremely important to our culture. Like we, 
we get protective about it and we only want it to be had by certain people under certain circumstances. And my approach, I mean, from the time I started having sex onward was a lot more like play in the dirt, get your knees scraped up and worry about it later. <laughs> and I think they're, you know, it's the same as the way that I've approached culture, you know, take joy in something first, take pleasure in something first. And only later when people give you shit for it, do you bother to ask questions? <laughs> well, it's also about sort of like, because it's, it's it ties so um, powerfully to all the stuff about food in the book as well, because it's sort of like, uh, you know, you there's this idea of the forbidden thing, you know, and sort of being drawn to that. And it seems like part of what you were doing and continue doing in your life is sort of like looking at uh, the being drawn to the things you're not supposed to like and and wondering like what is it about that thing and like the sex and food have those twin powers to me i feel like a lot of like when we're talking about food and like the donald trump mcdonald's photo we're really talking about or we're connecting to that same erotic impulse yeah i mean at the very least we are consistently talking about appetites and yeah particularly you know, I'm I'm gonna be annoying as shit for a second. You know, the the Greeks had a whole bunch to say about appetites, and specifically mm. the element of your soul that is pure appetite, in contrast with the element of your soul that is pure reason. Reason tells you, you know, how to manipulate and how to make things happen to your advantage. Appetite just wants; it's a bottomless hole. Mm. And I think that. A big part of why I'm so drawn to conversations about food, conversations about sex, is I am a person of really big appetites, and yeah. they've always been kind of questioned and interrogated and used against me at times. I mean, there's a couple essays in there about uh, my relationship with my ex-husband, and it was a really bad, arguably abusive relationship, but in large part, that dynamic was because... He only liked my appetites when they were specifically for him. And anytime I wanted, you know, a food that was too greasy and calorie rich, anytime that I seemed to be interested in another person, whether I was or not, that was an appetite to be suppressed brutally, if necessary. Yeah. Like it's, mm -hmm. it very much is a book about appetites. Yeah. And, and the, uh, how dangerous the appetite is as well. Like I, that's why I, I, I want everyone, I highly recommend this book in part because of how well you balance that. Um, it's not a book that's just about like be a hedonist and like, let's all just, there's something, um, there's something about understanding and those chapters about, we talked about it when you were last on the show about Guy Fieri and like the, the, was it peace, love and taco grease? Um, that, that really great and really wrenching story um, for me, got at what was so profound. I, I don't even want to embarrass you, but what, profound about what you're getting at, which is that the appetite has two switches to it. Like there's the appetite that is destructive, um, but there's the appetite that is that is you, and that like is you know what you like who you really are, and 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 that part of it. Like when you think about like, would you rather? be in a grad seminar talking about a Heidegger or would you rather be like having sex and eating some lasagna? <laughs> like th there's some of us that are like, well, the answer is obvious, you know, one way or the other. And that part of it is, is something that I think is common to everybody, but we're all, we all have so much anxiety about what we consume. It seems like uh, whether it be sex or food, those are, those are, those are electric in part because we're so, we're so, like conflicted about what we want to do. Yeah. And I think, I mean, you definitely see that attitude reflected in just the sheer amount of like research and data that people insist on collecting about people's sex habits and people's mm -hmm. eating habits. Right. The entire like nutrition industry really hasn't advanced that much since the days of like adding vitamins to stuff because people mm -hmm. had vitamin deficiencies. And now once that was taken care of from then on, it's just been about teaching people to suppress their appetites. And if you're hungry, there, there's like a school of nutritional thought that drives me fucking crazy that mm. says like, if you're having a craving for chocolate, then that means your body is really craving this or that vitamin or mineral. And I'm just like, what the fuck? Just eat a bar <laughs> of chocolate. It's fine. Yeah. 
Right. Like just eat the thing you want, do the thing you want, not without limits, you know, to try and take care. But also, I don't see the wisdom in listening to a bunch of experts whose entire job is getting us to suppress urges. That project has never, ever worked. Mm. And that's mixing like the science with the Puritanism, you know, right. and the feeling of like, um, I don't know. It seems even like commercials I, 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 about like eating chocolate or something like that. It's like um, an indulgence, you know. Right. It's it's a sin. Like it's like this is sinful chocolate. Um, they have they like always the, present it like pornographically too. Better than with sex like the cake. Music I don't know. and the lighting. Yeah. I don't know if anyone remembers the better than sex cake that was like I don't know. I don't. It was like an actual recipe that was going around uh, my my neighborhood in the late '90s, and all the moms were like giggling about this cake. Um, and it gets out exactly what you're like this kind of like your need to apologize uh, whenever you do something that's just purely pleasurable. Um, it's right. something that you're not supposed to actually do. And if you do it, then you have to say like, oh, you know, I I'm sorry um, for, for like that transgression. Right. Yeah. We, we don't just apologize for it. We apologize preemptively a lot mm -hmm. of the time and not yeah. even literally like we apologize by going on diets when there is no medical imperative <laughs> to do so we apologize by trying to get too thin or you know in some cases by trying to be straight when you're gay like mm -hmm. these are all forms of apology yeah for the yeah. urges that we have that we're preemptively trying to quell and i just it's such a joyless way to live and it's specifically about trying to exert control over something that by all rights, you really don't have control over. It's very, very hard to control what you're hungry for, what you're horny for. Like it can be done to an extent and you certainly don't have to act on your urges all the time. But I don't really see the point in preemptively apologizing for wanting to do something that you aren't even doing yet. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's a weird view. Um, and a really, I mean, it seems like the root of a lot of conflict at both personal and, and political is, is, is restraint and repression and sort of thinking that those, uh, those, uh, I mean, you're right. I mean, everyone acting on whatever makes them horny, uh, you know, that uh, there are hmm. <laughs> <laughs> no good. <laughs> right. Yeah, exactly. And but the other end of that is, is yeah, the, the repression that comes with that. And that extends into everything. I mean, I really think it is connected to like, why do you like Creed? You know, you shouldn't, you know, you know, that that music is something that is like really, tr like really bad. Like you're uh, ge genuinely doing something bad by listening to Creed or I don't know. For me, it's like Wilson Phillips and shit like that. Like, I, <laughs> like the older garbage that you're not supposed to listen to is so perfect to me, you know, if that makes sense. And I even yeah. hear like even just announcing it now that I like Wilson Phillips is like, I have to say, I'm, you know, like, I know I get that it's bad. <laughs> but uh, that even that impulse to say I get that it's bad. Like, why? Why do I need to I say do that? the same thing? Yeah. I'm still I mean, to this day, I don't you know, you're if you're on a first date, or you're hanging out with somebody that you don't know that well, there tends to come a point in conversation where they ask you, like, what movies are you into? What music are you into? And I hate being the first one to answer that question uh, because yeah. what I want is for my interlocutor to, like, give me permission to like the things that I like by admitting to something themselves. Mm -hmm. And just, like, that's such a fucked up, ass-backwards way to look at the very low stakes project of liking stuff. <laughs> like, yeah. it should be enough that you just responded to it positively and... You know, it's not a Woody Allen movie. It's not out there like doing a bunch of harm. So what difference does it make? Yeah, it makes me think that it's not political at all. It's just really about like who's in and who's out and what's cool and what's not. Like what you're like yeah. part of what you're describing is sort of like just this hipster asshole that like thinks that the you know, they consume the right culture and they're cool because of it and the wrong stuff is uncool. Um that seems like it's it's maybe even bigger than the than the the sort of DIY punk uh, sort of element of this is a sort of like coolness element. Um, like it's not cool to like Marvel movies, right. um, unless you're like doing a podcast about the like imperialist sort of elements <laughs> or something. You know what I mean? Right. Like every little subculture has stuff like that. I mean, in in my particular group of people that I grew up with, 
the stuff you weren't supposed to like was, you know, new metal and chain restaurants right. and any number of other things to that effect. But every little group of judgmental people has those properties, even if they're not the same ones as mine. And so at the end of the day, like, I think it's not just about giving a second chance to this band or that movie. It's really about giving a second chance to your own instinct to like something, not in a let people enjoy things way, but just in a way where you are acknowledging that your pleasure matters. It might not matter as much as a greater political project or what have you, but it does matter and it is significant when something makes you happy. Yeah, it matters and has power and has to other people too. It's, I think it's part of understanding that is that like everyone's a pleasure seeker, uh, you know, in one way or the other. And it does drive politics. That's why the Trump McDonald's picture worked. It worked for both sides as sort of a representation of their particular point of view. Um, I wonder how much of this is is MTV. I, I you 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 were watching. It seems like you were watching two thousands MTV. I grew up. Yes. I grew up watching nineties MTV, and I think those were two different things. And like very different I, channels. Yeah, as I yeah. understand it, you had the the MTV news with those like newscaster types. Kurt that, Loader yeah. and uh, uh, um, all the different like yeah, Kurt Cobain dying. It was very serious. MTV was very right. serious. Even the and I think that it comes out in I think. To me, what will be the mo the most memorable essay in your book is uh, about Jersey Shore and about your father. Um, for me, that one stuck out because it sort of was a, a great exploration of the balance we're describing here. Um, but Jersey Shore came out what, in in the in two thousand late two thousands, right? Like two thousand nine, I think was nine. season one. Yeah. Yeah, so that's like MTV is a totally different thing. Like I watched the rea the reality, the real world and the reality, the birth of the reality show. And it was like people are dying of AIDS. People are going to jail. You know, there are drug addicts. There's racism and like heavy talk of that. And by the time we get to Jersey Shore, it's past the real world hot tub phase. Like the like when I think it was real world Las Vegas that I first I, I was exactly the wrong age for this because I was like 18 years old when they went to Vegas and I was like, oh, now MTV is not serious anymore. Now they're just going to party. But what you've done, because the Jersey Shore is sort of the apotheosis of the party MTV. And it's something that, that had like a profound, was part of a profound moment with you and your dad. And it's a really, I don't know, I, I really enjoyed that essay. Thank you. Yeah, Jersey Shore was huge to us. We watched it every year religiously. And at, at the time I was in college, I didn't have a TV there. So he would watch the episode when it aired. And then there would always be a replay of the episode right after. And he would call me at like 11 o'clock at night and walk me step by step <laughs> through the replay. And like we we did that for years. And it was super fun and important to us. And also, I think we both kind of recognize the ridiculousness of this thing being so important to us and being such a tentpole of our relationship with each other. But he and I, we both had much the same taste, which was like no taste at all. We To mm. this day, I'll watch anything just because it's on. I'll listen to whatever on the radio and barely even notice. Like mm -hmm. I, I don't really curate my existence all that well, even now that everything's on streaming platforms and it has never been easier to curate. But I, it, it was odd, even at the time, that like this show about hard partying mid 20s Italians was like, it was our life for mm -hmm. like four years straight. <laughs> I think it's funny that you're wearing like the gym tan laundry t shirts <laughs> and like that not being like a part of your life at all. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, yeah, that was always a catchphrase on Jersey Shore gym tan laundry. Those were the three things you were supposed to do every day to maintain yourself. And he and I got t-shirts that said that on them and wore them like all the time. And neither of us did any of those things like ever, even laundry, which is just a regular task. <laughs> we did not do nearly often enough because we were crazy depressed. Yeah. And there's a lack of, and, and there's like a lack of irony to the watching of Jersey Shore here too. Right. It seems like you're just watching it because they're, I mean, they're watching it in the same way that you like someone would watch Laverne and Shirley in, in the eighties. It seems like, like these are just pleasurable characters to enjoy their hijinks. 
Yeah, it was it was a very hijinks focused <laughs> right. episode of my life. It was very much like because at that point, Jersey Shore was really the first like crazy, crazy reality show, I think. I mean, there were the the Rock of Love and uh, I Love New York. Those were pretty crazy. But I think their craziness was lessened by the fact that they centered around celebrities. Right. And Jersey Shore, none of those people were famous except for being on Jersey Shore. That was what they did. That was their career. Well, it was like an anthropological show in part for Americans, right? To discover, because I never knew there was a place called Jersey Shore. (laughs) And I certainly didn't know that there was like a culture of people that acted this way, looked this way. And seem to it's really it's funny because Jersey Shore really kind of encapsulates a lot of what we're talking about. On the one hand, it's like this really popular show that everyone's watching, but it also seems like it's a symbol of what you don't want to be. Or like it reminds me of Jerry Springer actually. Like when mm. uh, watching Jerry Springer in the in the nineties, I remember like just like loving watching these trashy people yell at each other and then eventually start punching each other, and that was just fun. But then I took a I took a, a class in college where the professor was saying you know, that's just like minstrelsy. And that's just what and he, he used all these sort of words to describe like how horrific watching Jerry Springer was, and how, um, you know, socially, what we're doing is like getting pleasure off of these like, um, you know, quote, unquote, trashy people. And it's a way of like, sort of like, using pop culture to socially check what's accepted and what's not. I mean, the Jersey Shore people are really tacky, right? They're like kind of the epitome of what you're describing. Yeah. And they were, I mean, they were definitely people that I did not recognize. You know, yeah. I, I didn't uh, grow up with a Jay Wow or a, a Ronnie, but mm-hmm. like even on the level of them being trashy, yeah, I got to say a friend of mine grew up like next door to the situation and has showed me the house before. And it's a big old McMansion like that. That dude might not come from old money, but he came from some kind of money. And I think that is often true of people who make it a career to be like super trashy, like Paris Hilton absolutely comes from money. And she was like the ultimate trashy bitch in the early 2000s for sure. That's really interesting. I mean, same with Kid Rock, right? Yeah. Kid Rock comes from money. Yeah. I don't know what we do with that. I mean, Donald Trump is sort of doing the same thing, right? It's kind of yeah. like what, like the rich working class cosplay. Yeah, I think. I mean, you see a lot of that everywhere. Like at this juncture, mm-hmm. really rich people mostly know that it's not that okay to be really rich, and so they have to obfuscate it, or they have to like very performatively start up charities and foundations and give away sums of money that really aren't that sizable to them, but it looks like a lot of money to us who don't have money. And I think that's a big part of what makes their wealth seem tacky to those of us who feel that it is. It's it's as I was saying, it's the contrast. Mm. It's these yeah. people with amounts of money that we would kill to have spending it on stuff that we would not spend it on if we had that money. It's mm. It's not just about being rich or not being rich. It's what you do with the resources you have. It's again, it's a puritanical judgment. Yeah. What you buy is who you are. It seems like. And we're and we kind of take the bait with that. I mean, it's weird. It's also weird to be like that, you know, the working class and this like kind of like stereotypical image of a trashy person would be like the pure person somehow, you know, or the person that's that's cool or the person that is like uh, uh, um, un undirtied by capitalism in some way. It's it's a really it is a really bad assumption. It's bad. And it's it's shallow. It mm-hmm. really, it reduces people to these like zero or one binary judgments that you yeah. as an outsider are able to make about them. And it's, I mean, I don't want to be melodramatic, but it's a dangerous way to look at other people. You really miss the forest for the trees that way very easily. Yeah. It's also thinking like, oh, well, the working class are all people that go to NASCAR. And I'm like, all those people at NASCAR are fucking rich, man. What are we talking about? Like, right. It, it, like, look at the pickup trucks in the parking lot at any NASCAR race. It's those things are like fifty, sixty thousand dollars. Like you, you can't decide really anything about someone's circumstances based on the stuff they have in their house. Or, right. You know, you you really can't decide it based on almost anything that you can see from the outside. <laughs> I mean, yeah. you just you just have to know more than we are able to know. 
and it's a distraction at that point. It's really a distraction from anything that matters to like point at people at a NASCAR race and say, you're too rich or you're too poor. You know, you have bad taste, whatever. It's what is even the point of doing that except to point. And yet it's so easy to do. Um, and that's, it's sort of like understandable almost because it's all we have is sort of like yeah. what, what costume are you wearing the, the hot topic costume or are you wearing the limited two costume? And what does that say about you? I don't want to take much more of your time. And it's, it's terrible to bring this up so late, this subject, but I, I, I have to ask you about psychedelics because I, <laughs> I, 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 I so it comes up a, f- a few times in your book and it made me wonder because I wonder about like what is the mechanism that creates the criticism and the anxiety about living in this matrix um and it for for me psychedelics were a part of that as much as I talk about like oh going to college and like learning about stuff psychedelics were really powerful for me like as exactly what the 60s kids said they were which is like deconditioning agents but it also led me to like I don't know totally embrace that sort of like blank consumer anti-consumer sort of thing where it's just like it's all it's all made up man like money's fake money's just playing cards man like yeah that it's sort of like that's a very common culture and a very common like dude thing it's like get into psychedelics and all of a sudden like you're a wizard like you fucking know everything and you can see through it all and and i wonder what that was like for you uh because you mentioned like taking acid and mushrooms and stuff like that in your in your book yeah No, I I have a fair amount of experience with psychedelics. And I think you're right. They do lend themselves really well to that money's just playing cards attitude. Mm -hmm. Like if you've ever been on acid and you've needed to pay for something, God help you because I will be like lost in my purse for a solid 10 minutes, just picking up single dollar bills being like, what is this? Mm -hmm. And it's, you know, you, you feel that that experience of money is the profound one when you're done yeah, tripping you look totally. back and you're like you know money's so stupid that i didn't even know what it was <laughs> like that's not really the whole picture but psychedelics definitely lend themselves really well both to moments of true profundity and those shadowy moments of false profundity where you think you're arriving at this extraordinary universal perception and you do have to remember also you're just high and maybe mm-hmm. you're just having some high thoughts as opposed to incredible thoughts that you have to remember later. Yeah. And maybe and just try and have a good time. I don't know. Yeah. And I mean, it's, uh, it's weird to think of psychedelics as something that you like, I don't know, learn from and bring back the, you know, this coherent lesson. Like to me, like part of the lesson of the experience is to be like in that moment and not try to write it down because yeah. when you look at it later, it's going to be really stupid, like whatever yeah. you wrote down. And it's like, maybe you did have a, maybe you did have like a transcendent moment there, but it was entirely yours and entirely circumstantial. And, right. and it was of that moment. If it happens at all, you can't capture it the way that you probably want to, I think most of the is, time. is I mean, psychedelics are like part of the the left in some way though, right? Like they do play a weird kind of role. I mean, they're even, I don't know, they're in our culture more than ever, I feel like. Like when I was younger, acid and and mushrooms were just things that ravers did and were sort of like outside the culture. And now I'm like seeing like Microsoft commercials, you know, about like how mushrooms can help cancer patients and stuff like that. And it's just, it's a bizarre moment to live through because for me, psychedelics were, kind of powerful in, in catalyzing exactly the sort of idea you have about about sort of, I don't know, being overwhelmed by the torrent of pop culture and not being judgmental yeah. about it and just being like, this is just part of the ecology that we live in. I mean, yeah. And to say nothing of how popular psychedelics now are among like tech bros. I mean, they, right. they've kind of cornered the market on tripping, which is annoying as shit to me. I, part of me wants to be like, no, that's not for you. But, you know, they're the ones going to Burning Man and they're the ones talking about micro dosing and mm-hmm. shit. So, mm-hmm. OK, clearly it is for you. And maybe I'm the one missing something or maybe it's possible that we're taking the same drug and having a very different time with it, which would make sense. Because really what psychedelics have done for me is bring to the fore things that are really important to me, like things that I tend to bury a little bit so that I can live my day to day life. They come to the fore when I'm tripping and I always have these moments of like, oh my God, I'm so in love or Mm -hmm. I love this song. I have to hear it 20 times. You know, Mm -hmm. it's 
it's this very pure and childlike way to engage with your own brain, I think, for me. Yeah, no, I agree. Um, it, it sort of brings you to the space where you, that I think you're trying to describe in your book, which is a sort of like you know, the purity of approaching something pleasurable. I mean, it's like, see, even if it's a song you've heard a million times, uh, if you hear it uh, on psychedelics, it's it's a lot different. I had a very uh, Rax King memory while I was reading your book because um, the last chapter is about meatloaf. And, oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, and it made me think like... I. I was in Amsterdam many years ago. I ate mushrooms, like fresh mushrooms. Didn't really read the the little like guidebook on exactly how many you were supposed to eat. So I ate oh, way no. too many <laughs> and ended up like, you know, sitting in some coffee shop or something um, and kind of losing my mind at a, sitting at a table listening to Paradise by the Dashboard Light, which was on the stereo at this place, which is this epic... It's I learned I, I looked it up. It's only eight and a half minutes. You know, it feels a, like it's about thirty minutes long. It feels like an entire opera happening in that song. Oh yeah, I lived centuries. Uh, <laughs> I lived centuries in that song, and it made me feel. Um, and 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 reading your last chapter on meatloaf, may, like for sort of described a little bit of what why that's such a magical thing because meatloaf i'd never. I mean, it was very unexpected that you would write a chapter about bad out of hell. <laughs> <laughs> Except that it's a good as hell album. I will always yeah. go to bat for that album. <laughs> it fits perfectly with everything. Um yeah. because it seems like it's you know, meatloaf is as tacky as it gets. Yeah, totally. You're not supposed to like meatloaf. Yeah, I- it's just one more thing you're not supposed to like based on some declaration from some guy you've never met, but he's better than you. Let's all trip to Paradise by the Dashboard Light. Um <laughs> Thanks, Rax King. This is really fun. Thank you so much for having me. This was really fun. I am sweating like a motherfucker right now because my heat's on in my building. <laughs> heat is on and it's not that hot. It's not cold enough to have the heat on. It, no, it's like 50 degrees outside. I'm going to die here. <laughs> I'm sorry. You should That's go okay. uh, hang out on the fire escape if you have one. Yeah, yeah. All right. Well, thank you. I really appreciate it. Um, and I hope everyone goes and reads your book because it's something that I think you're getting at um, a lot of contradictions that are really, really important. And it's just super fun to read your book. Thank you so much. I also hope everyone reads my book. (laughs) Okay, folks, I think that's going to do it for us. I want to thank my guest, Rax King. Always super fun to talk with her. Go check out her book, Tacky, Love Letters to the Worst Culture We Have to Offer. Super fun book. And I think, you know, for people who listen to Nostalgia Trap, obviously on this show, we like to do a lot of mixing between personal biography, pop culture, and politics. And she just does this so beautifully with such great writing. I cannot recommend the book enough. Thanks, Rax, for coming on the show. Check out our movie club and everything else we've got going on on our Patreon right now. We're going to do one more movie club before the end of the year. If you want to be a part of that, join up patreon.com slash nostalgia trap and get access to all of our bonus episodes. I just realized we have more than 150 bonus episodes for our subscribers. So if you want to dig into any of that, patreon.com slash nostalgia trap. Really appreciate it. We'll talk to you again very soon. Take care. Bye-bye.